Hello, my name is Mina. Uh, I'm glad to be here with you today. I'm a PhD student at the Faculty of Philosophy in Belgrade, and my research is about Tolkien in the context of cultural memory. It belongs to the overlapping field of heritage studies and cultural memory studies. So today I wanted to talk about Tolkien and memory in the context of film adaptations directed by Peter Jackson. The main question I want to discuss is whether adapting Tolkien means misremembering or remembering Tolkien. In order to do that, I want to make a basic distinction between individual and collective level of Tolkien reception and mention three terms which are going to be crucial in our discussion today. They are interpretation, imagination, and memory. When reconstructing any fictional world in our minds, we rely on our abilities of interpretation, imagination, and memory. The way we understand and interpret things and the way we remember and imagine them are crucially determined by our cultural background, our value systems, our knowledge and mental abilities, our personal interests and tastes. Thus, we all imagine Tolkien's world in at least slightly different way. Why is that important? Fan communities often have difficulties in arriving at a consensus about proper treatment of the stories they love. The field of interpretation often becomes a field of heated debates, usually initiated by truth and fidelity claims, by thinking that only one interpretation is possible. And that is almost never the case, especially when it comes to works as complex as Tolkien. However, individuals frequently forget that. That is, in a way, inherent to our way of thinking. We naturally assume that the others see and understand the world in the same manner as we do. When that perspective is challenged, we feel threatened. And the more emotionally invested we are, the more defensive our reaction will be. We have seen that many times in fandom as well as in our everyday lives. So becoming aware of the relativity of interpretation is the first step towards better understanding of ourselves, of the others, and in the end of the stories we love. As you are probably well aware, Peter Jackson's film adaptations have caused such debates and internal divisions in Tolkien fandom. In my research in the last couple of years, I wanted to investigate the way people uh, imagine um, and remember Tolkien's world, as well as um, what are their attitudes towards interpretations. So I posed several questions um, which were related to that. Those questions were, do you think that anyone can and should interpret Tolkien's works in accordance with their own vision? What attitude do you have towards interpretation that drastically deviate from the books? And these are some of the answers which are the most indicative. Um, So it was possible to discern three types of attitudes. First one being extremely negative towards interpretations, considering them an unnecessary spoiling of the original. The second was a moderate attitude allowing for interpretations which retain the spirit of the original and do not deviate seriously from the books. And finally, the third and the positive view was supporting the variety of interpretations as a means of pro promoting Tolkien and discovering and generating new meanings of the primary text. The first group used the strict fidelity claim as the only evaluation criteria. And the second one required a general fidelity to the spirit of the world and the essence of the story. And the third and the last one is the one which sees adaptation as creative works expressing different visions and interpretation, inspiring, inspiring us to approach the original from other perspectives. Participants mostly had an attitude that anyone is allowed to interpret Tolkien's works in whatever way they want but that it doesn't mean that they would necessarily be interested in said interpretations, especially if they seriously deviated from the books. The second aspect of people's interaction with Tolkien I was interested in was imagination. And rather than assuming, I decided to uh, pose a question and uh, establish how people's imaginations work when it comes to Tolkien's fictional world. And these are the summary results for 3,000 participants who were asked to determine what are the major influences on their imagination uh, and their imagining of Middle Earth. As you can see, the descriptions and maps from the books ranked first, the films closely followed, um, the third and fourth place were occupied by artworks and book illustrations, which is significant if we bear in mind that the art of Alan Lee and John Howe determined the aesthetics of the films as well. 
when combined, um, all those visual media exerted a huge influence on people's imagination. Many concerns around the patient are caused by the idea that visual media are able to take over our imagination and override the influence of the text. While that is true to an extent, it cannot be taken as a rule, because my research has shown that people are well aware that they are making a composite reconstruction of Tolkien's world based on different sources. This is aptly demonstrated by a number of answers similar to this one. I very much pick and choose which aspects from all these things I agree or disagree with, but have a little of everything in my imagination. Uh, this statistic indicates that visual media do make a lasting impression on our mental images of a particular fictional world. Significant number of participants pointed out a uh, significant number of participants pointed out the pervasive impact the Jackson's adaptations have had on their imagination. Some of them liked it, the others regretted it. On the other hand, some of them expressed particular satisfaction that their own vision of Tolkien's world, formed prior to the appearance of the films, has been preserved. Some of them pointed out that the books are still the main influence on the way they imagine the world, and others acknowledged the impact of the films but also detected other influences such as games, for example, The Lord of the Rings Online, fun art, real world locations, rereading of the books, reading of the Silmarillion, etc. All this indicates that Jackson's films have significantly altered and determined the current visual experience of Middle Earth. However, it is impossible to determine to what an extent people are able or willing to divorce their mental pictures from the adaptations, since that is a highly individual process. So in terms of imagining Tolkien's fictional world, we can conclude that people build their personal complex visions of the world by relying on the text, but also combining them with their preferred interpretations in other media. Our memory and our imagination are clearly affected by film adaptations when it comes to visualization. However, that is only one aspect of our memory related to the books. The question is whether our uh, remembering of the story itself has been affected by the adaptations. It is important to notice that misremembering happens in different areas of Tolkien reception. Good example of that is a photo which widely circulates as a photo of Tolkien, but it is in fact a photo of a different person, which, whose name is uh, Clarence Elliot. And if you are interested in other examples of misquoting or misappropriating Tolkien, I recommend the Tolkienist's blog, where Marcel has published a series of posts under the title Things J.R.R. Tolkien Has Never Said, Done, Written, or Had Anything to Do With. It is very useful. Um, one of the frequent mistakes Marcel also pointed out in his posts is that is about the worse, not all those who wander are lost, which is frequently encountered in its impoverished form without the word those, only not all who wander are lost. In other cases um, are certainly film quotes, which are um, frequently and widely attributed to Tolkien on the internet. And some of them are book quotes, which are slightly changed, as for example, the Gandalf's quote, all we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us, which in the film version has to us. The other more obvious, exa the other more obvious examples are similar to Galadriel's quote, even the smallest person can change the course of the future. If you Google that quote, you will see that on many websites it is attributed to Tolkien, and that is a way of misremembering. Similarly, as Sean Garner has kindly pointed out to me, uh, there are people who are convinced that Aragorn's speech at the Black Gate comes from the books. So in that context, I would like to propose a thesis that the accurate adaptations are in a way more dangerous for our memory than the less accurate ones. The small changes and slight differences uh, which are made in the spirit of the original are difficult to notice. That is because our minds generally focus on remembering the meaning of the story, not the details. The details um, and the knowledge of details is acquired through repetition, through repetitive reading or watching uh, in the case of films. But for many people, uh, 
they won't actually notice or pay attention to many changes as long as they don't deviate drastically from the core of the story. And that was the group which was most numerous in answers when uh, interpretation was concerned. So uh, for the people who would swear that they remember Aragorn's speech from the books, this speech fits in perfectly with the rest of the original story. And they find it hard to believe that it isn't a part of it. On the other hand, that surely won't happen in the case of some other speeches from the Hobbit trilogy, for example. In my surveys and interviews, many comments related to Peter Jackson's adaptation demonstrated that fans particularly dislike the major deviations not adequately explained or justified within the text narrative logic. And that's why many participants consider the second trilogy to be a poor adaptation. Some even described it as pure abomination. In addition to that, the frequency of rewatching re the Hobbit films is drastically lower than in the case of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. So paradoxically, the fact that the adaptation of the Hobbit is less accurate made it less popular, but also at the same time less dangerous in terms of misremembering the details of the story, because people are more aware of the changes and more careful about them. As one of the participants put it, the changes in the first trilogy didn't bother him because the spirit of the books was preserved, whilst in the second trilogy those changes simply could, could not be ignored. When confronted with adaptations, we need memory in order to experience the difference as well as similarity. The enduring appeal of adaptation, but also our, our frustration uh, with them, lies in the dynamics of the recognition and remembrance inherent in the adaptation process. So the main problem fans usually have with the adaptation lies, lies in the fact that they are not remembering the beloved source material correctly or are altering the core of the story. When creating content inspired by Tolkien's world and aiming to express their personal vision, creators choose to remember with fidelity, as much as that is possible, or knowingly misremember some elements to suit their creative aims. The same thing can be said for all the fans. As previously pointed out, our individual visions of any fictional world are usually constructed as a combination of many sources and influences. As we cannot expect that our personal vision will correspond with everyone else's, we also cannot expect, expect that any adaptation will be a literal translation and a copy of the original. In addition, some changes introduced by the ones who are adapting stories are created in order to make the stories more relevant for us in the present and not with the intention of ruining the original. Finally, as Tom Shippey put it, the film adaptations have been, for many people, another road to Middle Earth, which is confirmed by the fact that almost a third of the participants in my research were drawn to the books after seeing the films. The Lord of the Rings film trilogy has brought about the existence of fandoms exclusively devoted to the films, but is, also, but is also to be credited over and above any other previous adaptation for bringing numerous new readers into Tolkien fandom worldwide. And that is of crucial importance if we look at it from the perspective of collective and not individual memory. If we consider all this from the perspective of collective memory, we may understand why adaptations should be first and foremost regarded as the tools of remembering. They are actively contributing to the affirmation and continuous presence of Tolkien in global cultural memory. The fallibility of our individual memory is corrected and made up for by the collective efforts and knowledge provided by the community of fans. Fandoms consist of many members who pull what they know in order to contribute to the overall understanding of their favorite stories. The rise of the internet and new media has enabled easier and broader communication among fans, facilitating knowledge sharing and dissemination on a level which has never existed before. It created online spaces where questions are asked, dilemmas solved, debates initiated, values and ideas negotiated. Various interpretations and adaptations of Tolkien's works created in different media are only one mode of remembering Tolkien. Collective memory and shared knowledge related to Tolkien have many other forms and sources I tried to summarize here. The complexity and diversity of Tolkien related organizations and activities illustrated here demonstrate that his secondary world affects people deeply on many levels. It also inspires the desire to maintain, share, protect and develop his stories, ultimately securing his prominent position in humanity's cultural memory. 
all combined, they represent the mechanisms of establishing, preserving, and popularizing Tolkien's heritage. Speaking of heritage, the most important premise within heritage studies is that heritage is a process of choosing the things inherited from the past that we find valuable and meaningful in the present and wish to preserve for the future. Also, heritage exists only when it is alive, when it is actively interpreted, used, appropriated, or identified with. By bringing numerous new fans into Tolkien fandom, the film adaptations were only useful in this process and they are helping keep Tolkien's heritage alive. His world gains additional value and significance to increased use, and we shouldn't forget that it is usually used with, admir with admiration and love. The strength of Tolkien's legacy is such that no interpretation can really harm it. Nonetheless, new interpretations can produce, produce added values, motivate discussions, attract new people, thus keeping his heritage ever more present and alive and meaningful for us in the times that we live in. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, Mina. That was absolutely fantastic. And I think um, you've got so much useful research there as well that we need to use going forward with regards to talking um, scholarship in general, considering some of the discussions that have kind of uh, arisen recently about how valuable new interpretations are within our own context of the 21st century. You, you've just highlighted that so, so well. So thank you so much um, for sharing your research with us here today. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to open it up to a couple of questions um, as well. Can you please make sure you're using your, uh, raising your hand as well. We'll then call on you uh, once you've um, popped up your hand and you can um, ask Mina a question. Okay, so first we have Aaron. So, uh, ooh, want to just one mute. Okay, Aaron, over to you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, all good. Uh, yeah, I was wondering why are the Rankin Bass adaptations, The Hobbit and the Return of the King, or the Bakshi uh, adaptation uh, not included with that analysis? Uh, okay, I think I have uh, answered your question in the chat, but I'll, <coughs> I'll say it again. Uh, so there are other answers which were not included in this uh, chart because I didn't find it uh, relevant for this occasion, but those answers were less in numbers. So this was like the highest ranking ones, above three, 300 answers. So there were also animated films as well as an influence and other stuff. It's not uh, the final list of it. So, yeah. Oh, I'm surprised you didn't include those. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Aaron. Um, and our next question comes from Danny. So, uh, let's talk. There we go, Danny, over to you. Hi there, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, I'm just, thank you for that. That was really fantastic. I'm just curious about one of your final slides, the slide that stated the sort of founding assumption of heritage studies. It's a very cognitive assumption, the idea that heritage is formed by people making deliberate choices about what to include in whatever becomes a kind of heritage corpus. And I'm just wondering if you can say a little bit about what sort of, um, well, for lack of a better word, non-cognitive factors due to things like creating the Tolkien heritage. So I'm thinking about not just Peter Jackson's creative choices, but say much more mundane things like budget constraints, marketability, um, those sorts of less um, uh, sacred, I guess more profane kind of influences in terms of what shapes adaptation and how that impacts the heritage. Okay, so if I understood correct, correctly your question, um, it's not about uh, rational choices always. Uh, we choose things because we are emotionally attached um, and also we choose them because we recognize some values which are important to us. 
So uh, when we're speaking about heritage in general and choosing things which are important to us, that's not uh, like a decision only. Um, it's, for example, as if uh, you have inherited many things from, for example, your grandparents, but then you don't decide to keep all of it. You decide to keep only the ones which are specifically meaningful to you and emotionally relevant and remind you of them. So in a way, that's how we make choices with uh, heritage in general as a society as well. We choose the things which are important for our, 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 uh, sorry, uh, our identities and then we decide to preserve them and pass them on. I don't know if that, that answers your question. It certainly does um, to a degree, thank you. I think I probably um, misled you with the term cognitive and non-cognitive. I shouldn't have used that. I guess I should have um, drawn the distinction more between um, choices, cognitive or non-cognitive, whichever, like you say, sort of emotionally inflected or rational, um, and instead made it more about um, creative choice and um, more pragmatic choice. But I'm happy to um, leave this discussion if other people have questions. Okay, well, it can also be a creative choice, but when we are making creative choices as well, like when Peter Jackson was choosing what to adapt, he is choosing the thing he likes and he identifies with as well. So it sort of like perpetuates the life of that heritage in a way by doing that. So that's when we talk about the adaptation, not like creation, ex nihilo. Okay, super. Um, and we ha do we have a question that we generally oh. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Luke as well. So Luke Shelton, I'm just going to allow you to talk. Um, that should come up. Yeah, over to you, Luke. Right, great. Um, I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, I really liked the way that you talked about how memory allows us to experience both difference as well as similarity. I thought that was really interesting. Uh, I did have a question to see. Uh, it might be out of the range of your uh, study, but I wanted to ask, um, have you seen memory as allowing us to feel kind of the uncanny in that something that is both different and similar at the same time? Mm -hmm. I haven't thought about it, to be honest. <laughs> that's an interesting question. Um, I guess, yeah, that's uh, the situation when you have uh, the sense that something is familiar and it probably happens with some stories. Um, I, I'm not sure it is uh, applicable in uh, the case of talking. Maybe it is because it's becoming like widely circulated um, and globally uh, acknowledged stories. So many people who even haven't seen the films or read the books have encountered it in a way. Uh, but yeah, I haven't really thought about it. Good question. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for answering. Super. Thank you. Um, and okay, so we have about one minute left. Does anyone have another question? If you do, just pop your hand up if you have one more question for me now. Okay, right. So Mina, thank you so much um, for your presentation. Like I said, I think um, what you were saying about the value of new interpretations moving forward is integral to uh, what we need to be thinking about with Tolkien studies in the 21st century. So thank you very much um, for being here today. Thank, thank you. you for having um, me. Thank you. Okay.